Hello, and welcome to another episode of Let the Bible Speak. Thank you so much for taking some time out to consider the things of God, because really that's all that's important. When we think about this world and we think about everything that's going on, and there's constant reminders that everything that God's word tells us is true. You know, one of those, you know, aspects that you think about in life is the fact that God created this universe. God created everything there is for us to be able to, to live and to survive. God really did think of everything for us and provided a perfect habitation for us. And, you know, as you think about there's, you know, scientists are trying to get people to have life on, on the moon or Mars. And, you know, they've spent all kinds of money, you know, looking and exploring the universe to see there's other, you know, planets that are similar to Earth that could sustain life. And people think about aliens and all kinds of stuff. What that is really doing is ignoring how perfect our situation is here on Earth. There's a reason why Earth is perfect for us. There's a reason why the atmosphere and everything that you think about that allows us to have life actually is here on earth where we are, where the humans are, the only verified place that there is. You know, I think about, um, you know, there's different scientific discoveries on, on different planets of like, oh, this evidence shows that there probably used to be water here. And so if there was water here, that means it could sustain some type of life. And it's just all speculation. There's no verified uh, you know, true evidence that we know of that proves that there's been life on any other planet. You know, they, they try to use, you know, scientists have tried to use certain, you know, pieces of evidence to, to try to prove that, but there's nothing that has happened to show true verified evidence um, that there that there is or, or was life. There, there, there just hasn't. There's only speculation. So why do I bring that up? Why do I mention that? to start this this program. Well, I want you to consider today the fact that Jesus is our everything. Now, what does that mean? First, let's go to Acts. <laughs> it, it's just so great. We're going to look at four passages of scripture today to show Jesus really is our everything. So when you look at Acts 17, there's a, there's a passage here where Jesus, um, where, where Paul is mentioning something about Jesus. So in this context, Paul is in 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 Greece, um, the Areopagus uh, of Athens, and so he's starting to talk to them in verse twenty-two. All right, so he's addressing them in verse twenty-two. Paul says, um, it says, then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, "Men of Athens, I perceive." that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the object of your worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temple made with hands nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Boundaries. <laughs> the fact that earth is the only place that is as known truly to have human life and sustain human life, boundaries, our boundary, <laughs> boundaries of our dwelling is, is this earth. Uh, and then he continues on to verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him, or grope me, like to feel, search, and they think about being, you know, being in the dark, you know, you feel around and grope, that's what that uh, gives the uh, illustration of. He says that they, in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. 
Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think about the divine nature like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So Paul talks to them about this, what they're calling an unknown God. And he explains to them this unknown God created everything, created all things, gave you what you need for life. But he then, he clarifies that this God that created everything, he then can't be created with things like gold or silver. That's what he, his point at in verse 29. He says, you know, since we're the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature, so God, we can't think that God is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art of man's device. We can't think that we can create a God out of something we can create, right? Gold, you know, go, think about golden calves and, you know, statues and, and, you know, stone and things of that nature. It doesn't make any sense. If he created us and everything that we need to sustain life, how can we then create him? It doesn't make any sense. And then he goes on and he mentions, you know, these times God of ignorance, of not knowing God, he used to overlook. But now, he says, those, so those times of God overlooking those things are over. Now is time. He says, God expects everyone to repent. And then he mentions in verse 31, he mentions Jesus, how Jesus will be the one that he will judge the world through. And he's proved this by raising Jesus from the dead. It's, it's a great way to use science, use logic and reason to point to Christ. It's just, it was a great, really great way that, you know, Paul uses, um, uses this logic to them. And I want to really hone in on verse 25 when he mentions, um, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. So God doesn't need anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So he gives us, I want to make those three things, life, breath, and all things, right? Jesus is our everything. God has made sure for us to understand that he is our everything. You know, science teaches us that we need four things for life. And breath is one of those things. And you see it's mentioned here in verse 25 that he has he gives us breath, right? So he gives us breath. That's one of the things that we need to survive on earth. There are four things that science teaches we need to survive on earth. Breath is one of those things. And here, scripture teaches us that God gives us breath, right? So that's one of the things that God gives us out of the four. What are the other three? Well, let's turn back to the book of John and we'll see what those other things are. So another thing that science teaches us that we need to live is, is light. We need light. We can't just live our entire lives in darkness. Uh, we need light. So surely there's not a scripture that tells us that God gives us light, right? Well, if you turn to John chapter eight, you'll see, you'll see that very thing. In John chapter 8, I want to start in, uh, there's a the, the context here of the starting in, in chapter, excuse me, starting in verse 1 of chapter 8, the first couple of verses, it mentions that Jesus is, uh, he's um, in the temple early in the morning in, in, in verse 2, um, and it shows this is the woman caught in adultery. A lot of people are very familiar with the story. Um, they bring this woman to Jesus saying she was caught in adultery um, and, uh, you know, Moses commanded she should be stoned. But what do you say? You know, trying to test them. And so Jesus just stoops down on the on the ground and writes something kind of in the ground with his finger as, and acts like he doesn't hear them. And so he kind of ignores them. Um, and then after they kind of press him a little bit, he says, OK, you know, that, that you know famous line that a lot of people know, you know, he who is without sin cast the first stone. So, you know, if anyone among you has not sinned, you can throw the stone at it first. Now, what I think is interesting about Jesus saying that is the only one who was without sin there was him. 
So by his own words, he was the only one that should have been able to throw a stone at him. But he wasn't going to. And that was his point. <laughs> that was his point. And so, yeah, he, he doesn't um, do that. And then all the people leave. And then in verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but only the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no, no one, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke again, saying, I am the light of the world. <laughs> he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The light of life. Now, clearly he's talking in the spiritual sense here, right? But we can connect this spiritual message to the physical. I mean, because that's really what scripture should be telling us. It, it, scripture is telling us to do. It, it, all these physical situations that we're going through in life, we're supposed to connect them to the, how they affect us spiritually. Because our decisions that we're making here in the physical is what determines where we're going to spend eternity in the spiritual. So we can't just ignore the physical and spiritual connections. So when Jesus says here that he is the light of the world, it's not an accident because again, that's the second thing that science tells us. Science teaches us we need to live and to sustain life. One of them is breath. We already saw Acts 17, 25, God gives us breath. Here, God, through Jesus says he gives us life. So that's number two. What's number three? We turn back to John chapter seven. So, you know, go backwards one, uh, one chapter. The next thing I want to think about is water. <laughs> water. Yeah, simple, right? You know, we, we need water to live, don't we? In John 7, starting in verse 37, it says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, <laughs> let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. <laughs> So, here in verse 37 and uh, verse 37 to 38, Jesus, he gives us water. He says, if you thirst, come to me and drink. <laughs> it's it's so fascinating when you, when you just accept God's word for being God's word, right? The creator, our creator, he is telling us these things. He's, he's, he's begging us to listen to him. He's giving us every piece of evidence and every example and every comparable and metaphor. He, he's, he's filling us with all of this evidence that points to him. Just like Paul was trying to under uh, help those men of Athens understand in Acts 17, the first chapter we looked at, everything points to God. Everything points to this creator God who loves us and expects us to live a certain way for him. We, we just can't keep ignoring that. Jesus is saying, come to me who thirsts. <laughs> come to me and drink. Why? Well, he's got the water. <laughs> he is that living water. You know, uh, in John 4, when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, he mentions that, he mentions that also. He mentions this, uh, this living water. Uh, and it's funny the way he, he describes this um, situation to this woman, because she is, um, you know, she's coming to the well, you know, with buckets to, to draw water up out the well uh, for her to have. And so it was a task. It was a task that this woman would have had to have um, done consistently. And so, um, you know, in Jesus in verse 10 of John chapter four, um, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is to you who says, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So, you know, Jesus sees this woman getting water and Jew, Jesus being a Jew asks the Samaritan woman for a drink of water. And the woman's like, what are you talking to me for? Jews don't talk to Samaritans. And so, um, you know, it's a, just an interesting kind of response that she gets. She doesn't even you know, answer his question, she doesn't even simply say, no, I'm not giving you any water. She tells him, like, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, as in Jesus doesn't know that Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. <laughs> um, And so Jesus is like, if you had any idea who I am, 
asking you for a drink of water, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. And so she, she's, verse 11, she says, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? So she's she's thinking just strictly, you know, this this physical nature. Um, and Jesus is trying to teach her a spiritual lesson. He's talking spiritually. He's giving her living water. So again, it's two different examples here in John, in the book of John, where God, Jesus mentions, he has this water, this living water. Again, something we need scientifically to sustain ourselves to sustain our lives. So speaking of speaking of living water, right? <laughs> we need water to live. What's the last thing we need to live? Talked about air, our breath. God gives us that. Talked about light. We need light to live. Jesus says, um, <laughs> uh, he, I am that light. Number three, water. Jesus says, I have living water. So, Lastly, food, right? <laughs> we need food to eat, correct? So in John chapter 6, when Jesus feeds the 5,000 um, in this, this this great miracle, what happens here is, you know, he feeds them. And then the next day, you know, they took up um, 12 baskets of fragments, 12 ba baskets of leftovers. So the group of people who ate the day before, they know there's some leftovers. And also, I mean, if he multiplied the, the fish and the bread the one day, surely he can multiply those baskets of fragments the next day. So the next day, that's essentially what they're doing. They're, they're thinking with their stomachs. They're thinking physically. And they're trying to follow Jesus to get more of that bread, um, more of that food that they had the day before. And so, um, you know, they're trying to they're trying to get, get this physical feeling. And Jesus is trying to fill them spiritually. And so when you get down to, um, you know, verse 22 talks about it was the following day. And so when you get down in the context, verse 30, they say, what sign will you perform that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So these Jews, they know the history of, of their people, and they know that God gave the Jews uh, through Moses um, manna, this bread from heaven. So it, it was essentially bread that just kind of appeared out the mist. I don't want to say it appeared out of nowhere, but it appeared out of the mist. But it was miraculously you know, pro provided for them. So they would know that. Now, think about that. There's this famous story, this famous historical event, of the Jews knowing what happened with the manna in the wilderness with their forefathers. And then Jesus multiplies this bread for 5,000. So they're connecting that here. They was like, hey, what sign are you going to do? M Moses, he showed a sign of the manna in the wilderness. So essentially they're saying, Jesus, give us more bread. You know, that, that bread from yesterday, we weren't more. So Jesus picks up on that. Jesus understands what they're what they're trying to say and what they're getting at. And he understands that they're missing the point. They're missing the point he was trying to get them to understand. It's not about physical bread. It's about spiritual bread. And so that's Jesus' response to them in verse 32. Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. And it goes, you mentioned that thirst again. So here we have another example of Jesus saying, one of the four essential elements that we as human beings need to sustain our lives. He gives. He says here, I am the bread of life. It's not an accident. <laughs> it's so, so purposeful that scientific evidence proves that we as human beings need four things to sustain our lives here on earth. One of those things is air, breath. God gives us the breath of life, Acts 17, 25. Another one of those things is light. 
we can't just live our entire lives in, in physical darkness. Um, we, we need, you know, the vitamin D from the sun. We need <laughs> that light. John 8, 12, Jesus gives us light. Jesus gives us water. We need water to live. We will die of thirst, right? John 7, 38, we need water. Jesus gives us water. And finally, food. We need food. Bread. John 6, 35. <laughs> to bread of life. Jesus is our everything. He really is. So hopefully this lesson was uh, beneficial to you. Hopefully it was encouraging to you. But it's just another reminder that Jesus really is our everything. So what does that mean? He is our everything that we need in this life. When we're going through situations in life that we're struggling mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, he gives us strength in all things. Philippians 4.13, <laughs> right? He, he, that's just not, um, you know, specific situations. That's literally everything. So we have to be committed to him. So that's our mission here at Let the Bible Speak, helping you be committed and making Jesus your everything. Do you want more instruction on that? Do you want to know what exactly do we mean when we say make Jesus your everything? Be more committed. Not just talking about going to church every Sunday. That that doesn't do it. That, that, that there, there's benefits to that if you do it the right way, which scripture shows us, right? But that's we can't just minimize, minimize our, our lives to any one thing. You know, even praying in and of itself is great, but there's other things we have to do in addition to prayer. Studying God's word, yes, it's great, but there's other things we have to do in addition to that. So it all works together. Do you want more instruction on that? Please, please let us know. We're so we're so encouraged by anyone who's willing to learn more about God's word. So please give us a call at 843-553-5157. 843-553-5157. There's four things, uh, four benefits to that number. First of all, you can just listen to the, the message that's changed every day. It's a dial a Bible study message, which is a short, you know, minute and a half for two minute you know, quick spiritually focused reminder um, for you. Um, you can call that message every day and listen to it, a new message every day. So um, that's the first benefit of that. Just just call in the number. The other benefit of that, you can text that number, actually. You can text that number, any kind of scriptural, you know, questions, any kind of biblical questions, any kind of, you know, questions about life, right? You know, scripture tells us that he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So any kind of question you have about life, or, or godliness, we can answer that for you because we have the scriptures. So you can text that number, uh, any kind of question, and we'll, we'll text you a question. We'll text you an answer back. We'll do the best we can to give you book, chapter, verse to, you know, either answer the question directly or at least give you like a, you know, a, um, you know, kind of a basis for, for what that answer would be. So, um, yeah, those first two benefits of that, you can just call it, listen to the dial of Bible study uh, message, or you could text the quote, um, text a question and uh, we'll send you an answer. We'll text you an answer back to, to any kind of question you have. Uh, the third benefit to that number is uh, after you, um, you know, call it and listen to the, the you know, dial of Bible study such message uh, you have two options on if you want to leave a voicemail you can leave a voicemail and let us know that uh, you want to sign up for the bible correspondence course then bible correspondence course is a self-guided bible study essentially we um send it we you leave your mailing address and we send it out to you in the mail um you know it's it's a guided study it's uh ask you questions that it gives you the scripture for the book chapter verse answer and then you essentially are teaching yourself but it's it's guided right you know and you think of acts chapter 8 with the ethiopian eunuch when philip um came to him and heard the eunuch reading what we know as isaiah 53 and um philip asked the eunuch do you understand what you're reading the eunuch says how can I let someone guide me, <laughs> right? So we need to be guided in the scriptures. We can study, we can study the scriptures by ourselves all, all we want, but we need to be guided in the scriptures. And so that's what the Dollar Bible study is. It, it guides you in the scriptures, like the eunuch alluded to in Acts, Acts chapter eight. I believe that's verse thirty-five. So there's the that's the third advantage. You can sign up for the um, Bible correspondence course. And the fourth advantage is you can leave a message and just let us know our preferred our preferred thing we want to hear. Let us know you're interested in a personal Bible study. 
whether you're interested, you know, doing that in person or just doing it over Zoom, uh, we'll make the arrangements. We'll make it happen because we are interested in just trying to help, help you grow spiritually, help you grow closer to God, help you in your knowledge of the scriptures, help you because, quite frankly, there's a lot of false teachings out there in the world. There's far too many. And sadly, the, the name Christian is really getting a bad name because so many people well, it's had, a bad, had a bad name. But it, it, there's so more and more people doing terrible things and they're known as Christians. We try to distance ourselves from that. We try to be truly the type of Christians that you read about in the Bible, specifically in the um, you know, the book of Acts and, and, and throughout the throughout the letters uh, of the church. We really want to do that, and we want to help you to know that. You know, what's the truth? How do we truly follow God? You know, First John 4, 1 says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God. I mentioned that on last week's program, if you were able to see last week's program. And then we also mentioned how how do you test those spirits? How do you test yourselves? <laughs> 2 Timothy 2, 3, 16 and 17 tells us that we test ourselves by scripture we test ourselves by learn, learning and knowing scripture and comparing ourselves and our actions and our thoughts and feelings and desire comparing ourselves to what we see in the scriptures it, it corrects us it instructs us that's what we should be using it for so we greatly greatly encourage um you know personal study because there you can ask specific questions and you know we can converse and and really when you look at the book of acts that's really what you see <laughs> it was conversation uh, i just mentioned acts 8 with uh, philip and the eunuch it, it was a conversation it was a it's a personal conversation that helped the eunuch learn more about scripture he showed he was interested and then God sent him Philip to, uh, you know, be able to fulfill his interest in, in the teaching. So that's what we really try to do. So again, 843-553-5157. You can text any kind of biblical question, text any kind of question about godliness to that number, and we'll send you a uh, send you an answer back. We'll text you an answer back. So you can text that number, 843-553-5157. You can um, call it, just listen to the message for a dial the Bible study, you know, um, encouraging message every day or um you know at the end of that message you can uh leave a voicemail let us know you're interested in the bible correspondence course just leave your mailing address and we'll send it out to you in the mail or if you want to have a personal bible study you can leave a message and let us know that you're interested in that and we'll reach out to you and uh, and, and clear up those details and make that happen we also have an email address let the bible speak 843 at gmail.com that's let the bible speak 843 at gmail.com so you can um, sign up for the Bible course one course there. If you don't want to do the course one course through the mail and, and you just want to do it electronically through email, that's fine. We can make that happen. Uh, so just you can email us and, and let us know you want the Bible course one course and we'll just send it to you um, via email as well. So we have that option available to you. Um, and uh, again, you can text any, I mean, you can email us any questions you want to have or email us and let us know that you're interested in um, a personal Bible study. And so, uh, again, there, there's um, multiple avenues for you to contact us and communicate with us. And so we uh, would be encouraged by, by your presence, would be encouraged by your interaction and letting us know that we can help serve you in, in any way, because that's all that truly matters when you think about the things of God. So hope you were encouraged. Um, please, until next week, remember to let the Bible speak.